I'm calling to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, August 8th, 2022. Michelle, will you please call the roll? Ms. Deming? Present. Ms. Donahue? Here. Ms. Fosdick? Here. Ms. Grover? Here. Ms. Jane? Here. Mr. Karubis? Here. And Mr. Rising? Here. We have a quorum. Ms. Deming, will you lead us in the pledge? I think we have one board salute today, Miss Jane. <coughs> Prairie Children Preschool receives Gold Circle of Quality designation. The board salutes Prairie Children Preschool for once again achieving the Gold Circle of Quality designated by Excel Rate Illinois for 2022. This is the highest rating that can be received and indicates that Prairie Children Preschool places a high priority on instru instructional excellence, family services, staff qualifications, professional development, and program administration. The Gold Circle of Quality recognizes programs which have demonstrated a commitment to providing quality early childhood education to children in their district. Congratulations to Principal Sally Osborne and her staff on this stellar achievement. Okay, it is now time for public comment and 60 minutes is allowed for public, public comment. Each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups, and as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from the board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. Although this is not required, it is helpful for the board to know whether the comments and concerns we hear are being raised by residents. So we ask that you state if you live in the district and if you currently have children in our schools, which probably won't be an issue tonight because I see where most of you are coming to talk from. So, but thank you. Um, so we, will, we have 16 speakers tonight. So. We will keep to our three minute limit for everyone. And the first speaker is Alicia Smith. Alicia. Good morning, members of the school board and the district school board committee. I'm here to speak about Schomburg neighborhood and the school that gave me a walk to picture this year. Should we bring the microphone down? Instead of being a box. Uh oh, wait. Being, sorry. Um, having to walk to Fisher um, is a huge safety issue. The Gombert neighborhoods have been in the district, some of the oldest neighborhoods in the district, and the building where Fisher Middle School is now has been about a 204 building for about 20 years. When the building was the Old Granger, our neighborhoods were bused to the Old Granger. Uh, we, the administration, the school board at the time, did not deem that we should be walkers. When the building was the freshman center for Wabanzi, we were bused to the freshman center. The school board and district administration at the time said that we should be bused to that school instead of being walkers. But yet, now that the boundaries have been redone, this administration and school board have deemed that we should be walkers to that building instead of bussers, even though the area is busier and more congested than it was those many years ago. To add to the inequity of all of that, um, White Eagle and, White, and Eagle Point families were told that they also needed to cross Montgomery Road and to walk to Still Middle School. But today, they received an email and a phone call saying, well, this year they would be bused, but then all the following years they would have to walk. Yet, Gombert parents did not receive any such email or phone call, which just speaks to the inequities in our district for our schools that have large amounts of students 
from low-income families. Honestly, neither neighborhood should have to cross Montgomery Road because it is not safe for pedest or pedestrians to be walking through there. Commuters are not used to seeing students walk across Montgomery Road. They are dodging the traffic on Nequa and Wabonzi. I've never seen students there. Gombert neighborhoods and White Eagle neighborhoods and Eagle Point should not be made to walk to their middle school. They should be bused like they always have been. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Bart Dorfler. He will be followed by Sunil Dariyama. Yeah. Tell me when my time starts. I'm kidding. Good evening. My name is Bart Dorfler. I live in the district and I have two boys that uh, attend Still Middle School. I'm here tonight to talk briefly about uh, the change in the busing as it affected the residents on the north side of White Eagle. Before I start, I want to say thank you for your service. Too often you people work without any sort of appreciation. You hear a lot of complaints. I know this myself. I have served on three nonprofit boards as well as the Riverwalk Commission and the Millennium Carillon Foundation. Everything I'm about to share with you pertains to this topic on the bus issue. I spent seven years as an executive recruiter. I've also lived in the area as a realtor and worked as a licensed realtor for 30 years. I've also worked as a benefit auctioneer serving nonprofits in the area raising money for their missions. COVID hit and we couldn't gather people and that the, the career I love I lost because we couldn't gather people together to raise money for nonprofits. Unique to my experience I have worked for first student as a bus driver more so driving students within White Eagle to Still Middle School, okay? My two, my two children will attend Still, and they were not on my route. The point I wanna make <clears throat> is that while at first student, I was also serving on the recruiting team because we all know, and as one of your associates told me earlier this evening, of course, we all know how tough it is to hire and get bus drivers, okay? Uh, I do have a few questions that I will direct to your organization uh, via email for answers. I applaud your decision to put off discontinuing service in the northern part of White Eagle, whereas other students will get service. I'm not so crazy about the idea that this is a one and done kind of thing. Going forward, we would appreciate, and I'm speaking collectively, getting notice of any changes that affect our lives and those of our children more than 10 days or 15 days before school starts. Because obviously everybody would like to have a, a say where stakeholders would like to have a point of reference in terms of making plans or decisions that affect all of us. And I'm, I'm sure we won't have to visit that again. There are alternative solutions, again, because I drove through White Eagle and I know where if there were changes in the routing, that this would not be an issue come next year. So given the opportunity, I would like to be involved if in fact you want stakeholder input in terms of divert, uh, deciding what the routes are. Thanks again for your time and your service. Thank you. The next speaker is Sunil Narayana, followed by Nagesh Rao. Hi. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. My name is Sunil Narayan and I come from the Eagle Point neighborhood and my son goes to Still Middle School. This is about the bus issue again, <laughs> saying the default. So we have been in long communication with Ron Johnson about the various aspects of why, what, how, all the details. and. He's been extremely cooperative in giving us complete clarity in terms of where we stand and why we are not eligible. So I want to use this opportunity to impress upon the board the factors that doesn't fall within the framework of how you calculate the hazard points, because that is the critical piece that decides whether somebody gets an exemption. If you take the distance of 1.5 miles, nothing can be done. I can't move my house, you can't move the school, nothing can be done, it's, it's a fixed point. So, but there is this calculation of 12 points that decides whether a neighborhood gets an exemption to get a bus service or not. 
there are certain aspects in this. Some of the very uh, uh, straightforward aspects is, I know that the administrative aspects of how the score is calculated is not with this team, but there are the reason I'm bringing this up is there is something that this board can really do on. There is points allocated for the road width. We looked into the report that was shared with us where the 10 hazard points is arrived at. There is an image that shows how the road width is less than 40 feet. That was marked clearly into the beyond that white line where the cars then come. Whereas the measurement has to be on the path that the students will pass through. That is the distance that we are talking. It is clearly more than 40 feet. And we have measured it using the GMAP pedometer site. So that is one. Second is on the speed limit. I know the rule says that the permitted speed is what goes into calculating the number. And the permitted speed is 40 on Montgomery. But for any driver across the United States, the permitted speed is the minimum speed. A morning rush hour traffic goes anywhere between 45 to 55. 45 is considered slow, 55 is a normal speed on Montgomery. So when the practical aspect remains in one side, going with the permitted aspect, which is a non-existent thing, in arriving and saying that this is causing you to not be eligible for a bus transportation is something that we want to dispute. The third is the volume of traffic. We have been classified under the 500 to 999 vehicles per hour. That more sounds like an average of what goes through the entire day because Montgomery Street is the arterial road for many of the office goers from a major Ms. part Donahue, of Ms. Donahue, the speaker's there. time has ended. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Neg Nagash Rao, followed by Mickey DeVolder. Good evening, uh, school board. I did not think today was public speaking will be one of my fortes. And it, I'm, I'm glad I started, I guess probably there's always a start somewhere. Uh, but once again, I second the uh, Sunil's idea that I don't know why suddenly there is no bus service that's gonna happen. All these years it's been there, and why uh, within two weeks things changed and that uh, the bus has to be removed. I know it's been put back for this year, but I would rather have it all the years because what's the statistics that Sunil has provided, I'm sure, has given you enough information of what the students are out there up to in terms of crossing the street. So I don't think I'd want to wise any more further, but I think any common uh, person uh, who basically thinks about their kids uh, going to school in a safe uh, manner would rather uh, have the bus, uh, bus installed. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Mickey DeVolder, followed by Veronica Andrade. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for letting us speak here. Um, I live in the Gombert area. I have a, a granddaughter. I don't have any children myself still in grammar school, but I do have a granddaughter that attends Gombert, and she's going to be in sixth grade next year. And when we found out this year that there was not going to be any bus service, and they were gonna to have to cross. That's the biggest thing is crossing Montgomery Road. It's also in the summertime, or I mean in the wintertime, at the time where they're gonna to have to walk to school, you're gonna have these 11 year old children walking in the dark through neighborhoods and crossing busy streets to get to school. Now I don't know about any of you, but I w don't, wouldn't want my 11 year old walking in the dark and crossing at Montgomery Road is very busy during rush hour, and that's the, exactly the time when they're going to have to be there, crossing that road. And it just does not make any sense to me whatsoever from a safety standpoint that you would not be providing buses for these kids. These are little kids. They're only 11, 12 years old. The high schoolers get a bus. It doesn't make any sense. And so I just hope that you will reconsider this and allow those kids to take a bus to school. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Veronica Andre, followed by Vanessa Sanchez. Good evening, thank you for your time. My name is Veronica Andrade. 
I have three children at Gomber Elementary. They're in first, first, and third grade. Um, I am also, like my sister always just said, we have been grown up in this district. We attended Wabonzi, graduated from Wabonzi, and attended Gregory Middle School and also the elementary schools, McCarty and um, Georgetown. So we are alumni of this district. And what she said is correct. We've always been bused to that property, that location. I'm very confused as to why all of a sudden, but the property, property um, the re rezoning of the district boundaries is why all of a sudden we're busing Gomber Elementary to, or we're changing from busing to walkers. They, the children in um, Colony Lakes are gonna have to walk all the way to Yola, and then they're gonna have to cross over Ridge. That is a four, Yola's a four lane street. So there's only a stop sign on the Ridge Road. So you've got people turning onto Ridge. It's a very busy road. And then they've got to cross over, um, they got to cross over um, Montgomery. Montgomery. Right, sorry, with no crossing guard. So you're gonna have students crossing over Montgomery Road with no crossing guard. And once again, the speed limit on that street is 40 at minimum. And then come bring into the elements, rain, snow, the dark, and then we have this culture of people texting and driving. It's very dangerous. And then they've got to also cross, not only that, then they have to cross over Longbrook. Longbrook Drive. So that's three intersections that they actually have to cross, not just one. The safety threshold is, from what I told, is 11 to 12. So the threshold is 12. So we're at an 11. So we're going to jeopardize our kids' safety for one point. We're going to wait for a tragedy to happen because of one point. That's not in the best interest of our, our children. And whereas my kids aren't going to Fisher this year, they will be going in a few years. And I should hope that the district would keep the safety of those children in their minds when they're rethinking about not busing our kids to Fisher. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Vanessa Sanchez, followed by Dina Nath Nath Sulaki. Good evening. I'm here to talk about transportation, surprisingly. Uh, my name is Vanessa Sanchez. I have two children, one that's currently at Wabansi and one that will go to Fisher. Um, I do have concerns about the traffic and us not getting a bus for Gombert. Um, like previous speakers had said, the intersection is very busy. Um, Eola is now a four lane road. My concern is also regarding how if we are expected to walk, what is a safe passage for us to walk through? There is a passageway that goes through Gomber that is hardly ever plowed when the snow comes. If we were to walk, there are two ways in which I would walk. I live in Colony Lakes. We would have to go west and up Eola and cross all those streets. That side on Eola going north is never plowed. So the children either walk there or we have to go east around and then make another turn onto Eola and go north. Regardless, if we have snow, ice, it's most of the year it's cold. And I really challenge um, anybody who's looking at this with clear eyes to go into the Gombert neighborhood and go to the most southeast portion of the neighborhood and take that walk and see if an 11 year old at four o'clock when it's dark can walk through the snow with an instrument with their chromebook with all the things that they carry and see if they'll make it to school on time and i think the other concern uh, that we have is this is going to lead to obviously parents being concerned and just driving or finding ways to drive their kids the congestion that's going to result in the car rider line through Fisher is going to not only be absurd, but it's going to create a further safety hazard as you pull out of Montgomery or out of that onto Eola. And because people already have a difficult time going south on Eola through that intersection, the car rider line is just going to be much longer. It's gonna create more congestion, more traffic in that area, and a bigger hazard for the kids that do need to walk. So I really hope that you would reconsider, um, you know, to, and just, it, we're one point away, one point away. And it shouldn't, we shouldn't have to risk our kids for one point, so thank you. Thank you.
Anand Sozaki is followed by Nitin Gutam Gitum Gitutam. Hello. Please say your name for me. Uh, I'm Dinanath Solake. Good uh, evening, everyone. Uh, again, we're talking about the same uh, topic here. Mm -hmm. I have two kids, uh, one going to Still and one to White Eagle. And I think anyone who lives in that neighborhood who has seen Montgomery Street and Frontenac and, and that entire neighborhood can tell it's not safe for kids to walk there. Um, there are many hazardous, I think, situations there. If you guys kind of go and uh, look at that place, I think uh, for kids to walk in the dark in winter in that neighborhood, especially in the Frontenac, where it's not entirely a residential place, is, is I think, very difficult for parents to kind of think of sending our kids uh, to walk in that in that neighborhood in, in winter when it's dark there. Uh, one thing I think um, one of our uh, friends couldn't complete his point about Sunil was the traffic in that area. I think they have been classified as uh, somewhere, I think, uh, 500 to, to uh, 1,000 vehicles in one hour. Um, I can, I think we would request that that should be researched and I think we should get the real data for the rush hours in the morning and evening. I'm, I can. I think we all believe that it's a it's significantly higher number of vehicles pass uh, that, that junction. And there is also a railway crossing just next to that uh, Frontenac and uh, Montgomery and that is usually the traffic backs up through that junction. And we have seen vehicles stopping like, all the way up to White Eagle and Montgomery. So I think it's it's not safe for kids to even walk around that neighborhood at any time. In fact, not just morning or evening rush hours. So I think we request that all these should be considered. And there are few parents who have kids in White Eagle and, in, and still, and winter with snow conditions, it's literally we have to basically work half day uh, and take care of this. Uh, again, this is one of the points I think which uh, a lot of us actually considered when we bought homes in this neighborhood, right? I think we, our kids will get a bus service and we have had this for more than 30 years ever since this neighborhood was built. So now to suddenly change and also the manner in which it was communicated to us is, is uh, a little difficult to even understand. These are kids that we're talking about. So I think all of these I we request that the board to consider and kind of uh, look into the safety uh, of, the, of the kids in this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Nitin Guta Tam. Nitin Gautam. And then the, followed by Caitlin DeVolder. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So my name is Nitin Gautam. I am at 1352 Tarabele Parkway. And it is like on the junction of like Montgomery and Tarabele. So I just want to say that whenever like in the morning and in during school hours and when the dismissal happens, and that time like trains comes and the traffic just backs up too much and then they are just riding too much in the speed and the posted speed is 40 but normally it is 50 to 55 when they are doing it also that area is commercial on the front neck a lot of trawlers and the trucks are coming they are taking very wide turns and wire turns are very like sometime during the especially during the winters they they slippery in the slippery condition they are very dangerous and even they are not uh, the traffic doesn't have like uh, any any sense of like okay patience that kids are crossing or something yeah. the green light is on and they are just waiting okay if they get any space they just try to move in between the space so it is very dangerous so we just want you to just reconsider your review about the bus service that's what I want to say because the kids safety is what we are here for thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is Caitlin DeVolder, followed by Julia Soldiers. Hi, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> my name is Caitlin DeVolder. Um, I live um, in the Gambert neighborhood. I've gone to 204 my entire life. I've lived here my entire life. Well, sorry, I haven't gone to 204 my entire life, but you know what I mean. My daughter is at. Um, Gambert as a kindergartner, and I only have a daughter that's going to be sixth grade at Fisher. Um, we found out a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, that we were not going to be bused, and a lot of us mothers are really concerned. Um, the slippery conditions in the winter, the amount of cars we've seen just slide off the road, 
all that's there is a ditch. So hopefully there's kids not there if that happens. Someone, a biker, got hit by a car in Montgomery and passed away a couple years ago. Um, the traffic with the train, I mean, they get backed up, backed up, backed up. A kid's trying to cross at the light on Montgomery and Middlebury, the amount of cars that I see that are stopped that just whip around to try and go another way, they're not going to see the kids that are crossing if the traffic is all the way backed up. It's extremely dangerous. It's very worrisome as a mother. Um, the IDOT, that you, the rubric we use, was made in 2001. Since then, everybody Distracted drivers, has a phone in their hand, talking, texting. It's become a major, major problem now. But the rubric hasn't been edited to include that in there. And I think that that's a big deal. We are only one point away. And I think that in the rubric it says you guys have the ability to give us an extra point if you deem it necessary. And I think that that's what we need here, both for Gombert and White Eagle. Um, White Eagle was allowed to keep their bus service because they found out a week after us. But for some reason, we aren't allowed to have bus service. Um, I know that we didn't originally have it to Fisher, but that's because we didn't go to Fisher. So everyone assumed we would have our bus service, and we didn't. We found out a week before White Eagle, but they're told that they found out too late, so they'll still get it for a year, but we didn't. So I think that that's really unfair, and I think that everyone just deserves a bus for their kids so that they're safe. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. The next speaker is Joya Soldis, followed by Vikas Yamaraju. Hi, I'm Julia Soldias. I live in Eagle Point. I've got a son going to Still Middle School and a daughter going to White Eagle, and she will be in Still Middle School next year. Um, I second everything that has been said about the traffic, the weather, but I realized that all of those things, as I was told by Ron Johnson, those are non-factors because they don't fall into the formula that is being used to calculate the hazard points on the state's book. Um, safety is an issue. I ride my bike myself leisurely up and down Montgomery all the time. I don't like crossing at Front Neck myself. I don't like crossing at White Eagle myself. It's busy. Yes, the speed limit's 40. Nobody does 40. Um, the measurement that Ron provided us says the road is 38.9 feet wide. When you go on Google Earth, it's 40 feet, which bumps us up a point. So now we're at 11 instead of 12 points. I question what other factors have been used in calculating the hazard points that are not correct, whether it be the traffic volume or something else. We may hit that 12 points if that needs to be looked at, or I think that needs to be looked at because clearly one point is already incorrect. Um, just like the previous speaker said, there is leeway. When I asked about the two point for hazardous travel, Ron said judgment points should not be used to generate or manufacture a serious safety hazard. For judgment points, we can only consider adding judgment points for warranted traffic situations. By statute, any judgment points must relate to hazards due to vehic vehicular traffic not already addressed at the base criteria of the study. Factors which would support judgment points include but are not limited to unusual accident experience, we've had a death there already, inadequate sight distance, railroad switching at a crossing, and high volume of vehicles crossing the walkway during the time pupils are walking to and from school, such as a shopping center, major gas station, etc. There is a shopping center on the on Front Neck and Montgomery, so that falls in there, and the vehicles crossing the walkway when the kids are going to and from school are going to be much higher than what is happening at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I would urge for them to look at that traffic flow again, because that may bump us up that additional point. So we're off by one point. Some families are off by a tenth of a mile. The fact that we're willing to risk our kids walking in the dark, trying to cross these streets when we don't even want to do it in, as adults, I think is borderline negligent. And I hope nothing happens to anybody's kid, because we don't want to figure out that extra point or go that extra tenth of a mile to pick somebody up. Next speaker is Vika Yamaraju, followed by Rosie James. Hi, my name is uh, Vikas Silamraju, and I would like to thank all of you uh, for listening to our concerns. 
as <clears throat> everybody has pointed out, it's all about safety, safety of the kids. Uh, especially, I, I live in the Eagle Point subdivision and my daughter uh, would be is going to still middle school. And as we have said, it's all about safety. And especially at that particular traffic light, there is no uh, like a stop. In a sense, the traffic doesn't stop. The kids can be crossing, but the traffic can still flow. The person who wants to take a right turn, all he has to do is yield. Similarly, in all directions, even though the pedestrians are cross crossing, the traffic has to yield. If there was a total uh, no movement of the traffic, that's a different aspect, but that is not there. Second, obviously, as everybody has said, there has been an accident where people are, uh, or whoever is driving for whatever reason in a hurry or things like that, they're trying to drive faster uh, or not uh, giving uh, much consideration to the, you know, the traffic uh, speed limits. So there are cases where things have had happened. And as everybody has been saying, during those rush hours, especially if the train, um, yeah, uh, you know, people are waiting for to cross the tra uh, tracks or get to their destination, they're trying to go fast. And so it, that, that has always been a concern. And then making these kids walk in the winter uh, with all their backpacks and, um, you know, the musical instruments, it's definitely going to be tough for especially kids trying to uh, go reach the school faster and even especially when they are uh, with a lot of uh, friends or something they might not be paying that much attention but and uh, uh, vice versa the, um, the drivers are not paying attention and the other concern is obviously uh, parents trying to rush uh, trying to pick kids both from the still and white eagle middle school I mean still middle school and white eagle elementary can cause uh, some uh, kind of uh, you know people trying to rush through things and as everybody said, these IDOT document is of 2001, so it definitely should be revisited and uh, talked about. And the analysis that was done was on the intersection of White Eagle and Montgomery Junction. And there was no analysis done per se uh, at the intersection of uh, Frontenac and uh, Montgomery Road. And then this whole concept of 1.5, yes, there is some number to be followed, but on my street, I'm at 1.49, my kid doesn't get two house down the line, that person is getting a bus ride. It doesn't make sense. It do, totally, like, uh, it's not, I mean, I, I, as I, everybody said, everybody should get the busing. And there should be some common sense also factored into things where most of the district, uh, most of the subdivision is not getting, or 70% is Ms. not Donna getting Hugh, 30%. Ms. Donahue, the speaker's time has ended. Yeah, and, and 30 <laughs> Thank you very people. much. Thank you. Speaker is Rosie James, followed by Mahindra Basarati. Good evening. Um, I am a mother of three boys that have gone through 204. Um, my youngest now is the first year that the boundaries were switched over, and he's going to be going to Fisher. Um, when we found out about the boundary changes, we were told that buses were going to be supplied. The only reason that I am even aware of this is because of fellow parents. I never received a notification saying that the bus service would no longer be offered to my son. School starts in less than two weeks, and now I'm trying to scramble, trying to figure out a way to get my kid to school safely, because I'm not just gonna send him out with all the concerns with the traffic. When Yola was opened up to four lanes, the theory behind it was to relieve some of the traffic off of Route 59 that runs parallel. So a lot of that traffic has now shifted over to Yola, which causes the traffic to increase, especially in the morning around that time. With such a short notice and still no formal notification saying that there's no bus service being sent to my son, I can't accommodate being able, I don't have the luxury to be able to take off work, come in late and leave by 2.30 to be able to pick up my son and get him home safely. So he has no choice but to walk now an unsafe condition. There's high speed of drivers and speeding, distractions. There's been incidents of unsolved murder, of a ki you know kids being hit on their bicycle trying to cross over without, you know, depending on the sidewalks to be cleared, salted, a cross guard, none of those considerations. And I am not comfortable with my son doing that. So I am here asking for you guys to help and consider the safety of our children, 
um, based on the, what I've seen on the points that are coming, we're point short. Um, we have White Eagle that they were a little bit under us and their decision got overturned and now they're getting bust for a year and we have nothing. And I'm trying to understand where the disconnect is and where the lack of communication is falling um, because there's a lot on the table that it's disheartening that you know this is affecting our children and decisions are made without even involving the parents. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> next, next speaker is Mahindra Basarati, followed by Shankar Fatwani. Hi, Hi. Um, I'm Mahindra Basarati. My daughter goes to Still Middle School. Um, I've been living in uh, um, Eagle Point for the last 20 years, and we have been getting a bus. And uh, you know, uh, everything must have been evaluated this long 20 years back. And then they decided that this uh, uh, um, you know, community needed a bus. You know, they must have calculated everything, and and and, uh, and we have been getting the bus for the last 20 years. And suddenly, you guys uh, took a decision that um, a bus is not eligible for bus. And within the community, as uh, other parents and friends said. Um, uh, you know, some people get the bus and some people don't get bus. You know, that does not make any sense. You know, we need to take a leadership, right? Um, we are all same tax, you know, all the, all the uh, you know, um, uh, community members are paying the same taxes. One getting the bus, one don't get bus does not make any sense. Even if it is 1.5 miles, we should take a leadership in the state and everybody should get the bus. And, you know, parents should, students should have that option. Even if it is 0.1 mile, they should have an option to get the bus. You know, we need to take a leadership as a 204 and show the state that, you know, that, you know, if you're giving the bus option, it is good for parents, you know, that gives the flexibility for parents and, you know, community, um, you know, will be more productive if we have a bus for all the, all the, all the kids, irrespective of it's 1.5 miles. Um, and I think that uniqueness, it, it will give us the, you know, um, um, you know, uh, opportunity to you know change the rules of 1.5 rules, uh, 1.5 miles. Uh, that is my opinion, and um, you know, um, this safety. Everybody talked about the safety of the kids is the most important thing. You know, crossing. I I, I agree with everyone that uh, crossing the Mont Montgomery is dangerous for the students, and particularly in the winter. And it's an industrial area. A lot of trucks taking right and left. Um, and it's very dangerous. And EAG, everybody talks about the EAG, environment, social governance, right? One school bus is equal to 40 cars, right? If you stop one bus, 40 cars are coming and uh, coming in front of the school bus, and how much carbon, fr uh, carbon print you are uh, creating it. And, and so, you know, I think as a, you know, we're all educated, you know, we all talk about the science and technology, right? You know, EAG is important thing we need to cover, uh, consider, right? Um, you know, we need to support the public transportation, right? Um, now you're taking away public transportation and asking every parent to drive and, and uh, add the carbon foot for it. You know, um, as an educated community, we need to, you know, we need to be unique and we need to take a leadership and we need to uh, be a, uh, uh, um, you know, um, a leader to change the community for, you know, um, um, for better direction. Not, not, not just following some 20 years old 1.5 rules. In this case, they must have evaluated 20 years back and that is why we have been getting a bus. Now you are taking out by some, some rules. Um, that does not make any sense. Um, then, um, um, and then, you know, uh, I talked about... Donahue, the speaker time has ended. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. The next speaker is Shankar Fatwani, followed by Jurgit Singh. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shankar Fatwani from Eagle Point Community. I second whatever Sunil and rest of others from Eagle Point Community mention about the safety and the environmental factor also. I want to highlight the safety reason for here. So the intersection between the Montgomery and Frontenac, let's just forget about the case. It's, it's dangerous for the adults. I do bike sometime and I'm scared to cross that road because the traffic is never at stop. The con cars are always continuously moving and the walk sign is, I guess, less than 10 or 15 seconds. and at the school hour, there will be 50, 60 students crossing that road. And is it not possible to cross within 15 seconds? So on the basis of safety, I would request the school board to reconsider the decision 
and allow us to provide busing to the school and also please consider the environmental factor that i think many of our communities were denied bus service if that is the case then there will be 200 300 cars lining up on your school side and that will be a extra burden on your end as well so please consider the safety and the environment factor and reconsider the decision thank you all thank you Last speaker is Gurjit Singh. Good evening, everyone. Okay. I have two kids. Uh, one is going to Bansi Valley High School. Second is going to uh, seventh grade in still middle. I'm from Eagle Point community. I live here from like seven years now. And... Um, we have seen like uh, from many years we have bus first till middle and uh, now suddenly this decision, decision is changed and we all are impacted not uh, like uh, there are many parents they they are working they cannot drop the kids they cannot pick up at like 3 30 time and there are so many my uh, friends already talking about uh, spoken about uh, the safety concern on the montgomery and frontenac street and uh, so many accident happened in last few years. We have seen many accident happen. Some cars have broken down into the fence on that uh, Montgomery intersection. And uh, there was a new red light installed on the intersection of White Eagle because of some fatal accident happened. So we should be improving to go into more safer place for our kids instead of uh, going backward. So that's my opinion. Bus is safe for kids and uh, I feel safe like uh, my son is not crossing uh, on this very busy intersection in very uh, like in winter or even in early morning when th this is a uh, rush hours. So just want to request board to reconsider the decision and uh, considering environmental factors, safety of kids and uh, to help all the parents to the community for the sake of community should consider the points like we are just missing one two points from the we may have 10 or 11 points and if you reconsider the decision it will be very helpful and everyone will be thankful to you thanks very much thank you Now we move to our consent agenda and superintendent report. We will start with the superintendent report. Thank you, Ms. Donahue, members of the Board of Education, Indian Prairie Community. Tonight I need to start off with some sad news. One of our students, Ms. Lindsay Paylies Smith, has passed away. She was a student at Still Middle School and had also attended Gombert Elementary School. Lindsay, in the words of her principal, Ms. Cornish, was a vibrant young lady who made a positive impact on many staff and students. I ask that we take a moment of silence to honor Lindsay. Thank you. We send our condolences to her family and hope that they know we are thinking of them and praying for them. As this is the last meeting before we officially begin school, I want to share some information. This year, more than 11% of the new teachers hired are graduates of Indian Prairie. Though we celebrate all new hires, it's, a great, it's always great when we are able to bring back a former student of our district to teach here. Graduates have a personal connection to the district and have a desire to give back to their schools. Our second week of STEM camp was a success. Both students and teachers at the STEM camp shared that they wanted to have this experience again next year. We have already started thinking about what we'll do differently next year to enhance the great program from this year. I'm very thankful for all the staff who were participated in STEM camp and made it a success, and all the students who came and made the program wonderful. Summer Boost program ended last week. Here again, staff and students were very pleased with the program. We had some people who normally work high school who were working in the elementary program, and they were very successful in what they did. 
um, they were very happy about being there. Again, we are looking at what we can do differently to enhance the program, but we're very happy about our summer boost program. As I mentioned at the last meeting, a multitude of construction projects took place this summer. Uh, from masonry work on a number of buildings to work on tennis courts to remodeling our family and consumer science classes at our high schools, we were able to complete or nearly complete some major work that will support our students and community. More than $10 million worth of construction work has taken place this summer and we're very pleased about that. We continue to seek out those who can work as teaching assistants for the district. We know there is a national shortage for those who are filling those teaching assistant positions. Teaching assistants work directly with students and support them in their endeavors. If you have the time or you know someone who does, please contact your child's school or our human resources office. Flexible hours are available for people by working part-time or full-time. Not having these positions filled impacts our students and our teachers and the rest of the staff who must cover the vacancies. So I hope you will consider working as a teaching assistant in our schools. Ms. Donahue, I'll return it to you. Did you have, did you have an assistant principal? Uh, no. We will just go ahead and approve it. Oh, so should I? Uh, just, we will just go ahead and approve it. As it is. Okay. Wait, so do you want me to do this or uh, no? Uh, we can go ahead and approve it as part of the um, consent agenda. As part of the uh, uh, consent. personal report. Okay. Consent. Perfect. Okay. All right. So next we'll move to our consent agenda. And I need a motion to approve consent agenda items E through M. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items B through M. Second. Second. What? What is yes. it? It's not exactly yeah. like we're not excluding C. So B. C. Oh, B is separate. Was it B comma E? It's, it's B, B yeah. M. B D E. Uh, I'm sorry. B comma and D. Through uh, D through M. B through correct. M. Correct. Okay. Or E through M. Okay. I'm sorry, you're right. E through M. Oh. No. B, D, no. B and E through, e through, M. through M. Thanks. Yeah. I will amend okay. my motion and make it that. All right. Is there a second on the amended motion? There's no second to the okay. motion. Okay. Any discussion? Michelle, will you call the roll? Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Yes. Ms. Jane? Yes. And Ms. Fostick? Yes. The motion passes. Okay. The next, um, we move to an action item. And I need a motion and a second to approve substitute pay increase as presented. Susan Ed makes a motion to approve substitute pay Increase as presented. Second. Okay. okay. Any discussion? Would you like to say a few words, Dr. Challey? Or? <clears throat> oh, oh, Dr. Lee's there. He'll I, say. Oh, I but, didn't notice that. But, but oh, I will tell. I, I just will say this very, okay. very quickly. Um, we are in dire need of more substitutes. Uh, this again is a national shortage, and for one where uh, without substitute coverage, uh, it's, uh, we, we would not be able to do the things that need to happen in our schools. I will speak very plainly. I had chicken pox when I was a teacher, and if my sub hadn't been there to cover for a whole week, I don't know what would have happened. So I truly understand the importance of having great substitutes in our schools. Dr. Lee will talk more about this. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, good evening, President Donahue, members of the board, and Dr. Talley. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to um, this action item. Uh, in our current workforce environment, Indian Prairie School District continues to have challenges in filling teaching and support staff positions with qualified substitutes. 
This challenge is not unique to our district, as Dr. Talley mentioned. Uh, as school districts across our immediate area, state, and, nas and nation continue to experience staffing and substitute teacher shortages. Um, in consideration for the board tonight is a recommended approval of an increase in all categories of substitute teacher and retiree compensation. This would include an increase to our current, um, to our daily sub rate to $15 uh, from its current rate. Um, the fill rate uh, for our daily substitutes has continued to decline, uh, as Dr. Talley mentioned. Um, the challenge in um, getting substitutes um, into our district um, continues to be something that we, we face uh, year to year. We believe this increase in considerations for the board approval will allow us to remain competitive uh, with our neighboring districts that are in the immediate area. I'll take any questions. I'm not gonna call on people, so if you have questions, discussion. Dr. Lee, could you state the uh, what the what you indicated the rate was going to be? I may have misunderstood a little bit. Yes, um, I believe. Thank you for the opportunity to correct myself. Um, Fifteen dollars is is not going to do it. <laughs> so uh, I misspoke there. We would be increasing it to from a hundred dollars, which is our current rate, to a hundred and fifteen dollars per day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I'll just make a brief comment. I, you know, I know we've, as a district, been trying to do more for our subs, and um, I think we this puts us in a great position, like you had mentioned, Dr. Lee, um, being extre extremely competitive, and you can come work for a great district on top of it. So I hope this attracts more subs to our district. So thank you. So I just want to be clear that this was not triggered because myself and Ms. Fosdick became substitute teachers. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, this increase, um, we haven't had one in the past three years, so it was, it was time and due. Yes, and I will help emphasize again that we do need more substitutes in the district. So anyone that's listening or on, uh, watching the replay, please consider signing up to be a substitute. Um, in a great district. So, any other comments? No, we capped you how much you can make anyway. So. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Michelle, will you please call the roll? Ms. Deming? Hi. Ms. Grover? Yes. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Fosdick? I abstain. Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Jane? Yes. And Ms. Donahue? I also will abstain. So, the motion passes. We now will have a presentation from Mr. Doug Icarius regarding the fall plans for 2022-2023. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Talley and Board of Education members. Um, I was asked to present. Great presentation. I'm try this again. All right. I was uh, asked to present about COVID protocols as we return to school this fall and what has changed since um, the end of last school year and what the beginning of this school year would look like. Um, uh, as a side note, it's also uh, part of the American Rescue Plan and ESSER 3 that we need to, at least twice a year, um, review and revise any kind of mitigation protocols. Um, our goal has stayed the same, to support a comprehensive educational program for the 2022-23 school year within the current requirements provided by local, state, and federal health and safety officials. Um, obviously, those have changed uh, throughout the last three years. Um, uh, a few years ago, we were obviously out um, 
and uh, learning from home. Uh, and uh, we came back in a hybrid model, uh, wearing masks. We've just gone through a lot. Last year, uh, we were able to start the year uh, in person. Masks were required at that time. Uh, at that time, and we finished off last year uh, with masks being optional, um, but still trying to uh, control transmission. Um, we find ourselves in a very similar position to start this year as uh, the different variants have changed. Um, our big change for this year is changing our focus from contact tracing to infection control. Um, we did hear also last week that CDC is going to be changing their guidelines again. Um, the rumor is that some of those will be very similar to what we are um, suggesting tonight as well. Um, we will be pausing contact tracing for proximity and distance to the positive case. Um, you will not see in this presentation that word quarantine. Uh, quarantine was a term used when we were contact tracing and identifying students who were within proximity and um, excluding them from school. I know some of that changed related to um, uh, vaccination status and those types of things. Um, for this year, we are not uh, looking at contact tracing uh, for those students who were within uh, proximity. Um, all positive and probable cases will be represented on the dashboard. Um, significant increases in a building um, will probably trigger additional communication, uh, letting families know, hey, we have um, four cases in your child's classroom or um, something of that nature so parents know if they um, feel like they want to um, uh, have their child wear a mask or do any of those sorts of things. Uh, it might include us recommending um, that at the time, um, not requiring recommending, but at some point there could be some different triggers. Um, and it may include, as I said, additional transmission control pro protocols. So um, following the guidance, infection control, uh, coat for if someone tests positive for COVID-19 or a, are a probable positive. A probable positive means they're showing symptoms uh, and they were, um, they informed us that they were near someone who was positive. It could be someone in their household, a relative, they were at an event. So if they were near someone who was positive and they're showing symptoms, they would be mo uh, identified as probable positive. Um, you determine the zero day. The zero day is typically the first day you have symptoms. Uh, and then that day is followed by five days of isolation. Uh, that term is um, what the health department uses. Um, and so for us, that would mean that those students would be excluded uh, during that time. Uh, return to campus is on day six, wearing a mask through day 10. Um, if unable to mask, isolation is 10 days. Uh, after the zero day returning on day 11. We also have symptomatic and without testing or refusing testing. Um, so um, if uh, those individuals would still isolate for five days, if they're still showing all of those same symptoms following the zero day, uh, and they would mask through day 10, if unable to mask or isolate for 10 days, um, it, um, if unable to mask, sorry, <laughs> need to pause longer, isolate for 10 days. Um, if an ill individual is not tested within 24 hours of onset of symptoms, household members should be uh, sent home. Uh, that means if it's most likely that they're positive, um, they're also seeing with these new variants that it spreads quickly within families, um, that those siblings should also be sent home. These are just under that area of symptomatic and without testing or refusing testing. Um, we are still recommending and encouraging masks, but that is optional. Once again, COVID symptoms, fever, 100.4 or higher, new onset of moderate to severe headaches, shortness of breath, new cough, sore throat, vomiting, diarrhea, new loss of sense of taste of smell, fatigue from an unknown cause, muscle or body aches from an unknown cause. Um, so um, just once again, it's, it's in, if, if you are having symptoms or if you're sick, you should um, you should stay home. Um, some people have asked uh, with the probable ones or um, if they have a note from the doctor that says it's not COVID, but they, you know, let's say have strep, 
Um, and they're on an antibiotic and won't be contagious within a certain amount of time, um, and those symptoms ease up, they would be able to return to school at that time. Um, so there, um, those are other opportunities there. Um, there's been a lot with five days, 10 days, 14 days. Um, so I did ask for information about how this went from 14 days to 10 days to five days. Um, and so um, this chart represents the distribution of transmission potential over time during the course of illness. So they're saying approximately 97% of the transmission is happening within those first seven days um, after um, exposure. Um, but it's almost completely, it's very minimal by the time you get to day 10. Um, that's where you'll see that goes down to that point two from day 10 to day 14. Um, and um, you know, hardly there uh, beyond 14 days. Some transmission control protocols, disinfection. Um, last year we were still, every time there was a positive case, um, we would actually at times have to disrupt, do quite a bit of disruption to go into cleaning protocol mode um, in the buildings. Um, our data did not show that that helped reduce that, and the more we've learned, uh, we know that that wasn't making um, a, a huge difference for uh, what that was costing us in probably financially as well as with um, uh, the resources to do that. Um, so dis, um, we will return to pre-COVID-19 protocol, um, but disinfection may be used when there's high positivity in certain classrooms, in certain buildings. Um, I say in here quite a bit about high positivity. We're looking at in our school buildings. Um, right now, an outbreak is defined as if you have 10 cases, but it's not defined where those 10 cases are at. Is it 10 cases in a classroom? Is it 10 cases in a building? Um, so is 10 cases in Matia the same as 10 cases in Clow? Um, and so we're looking at, you know, in those classroom settings and what we're um, seeing in those classroom settings. So when we talk about high positivity and we start to see um, growing numbers in a certain classroom, as I said, we're going to increase communication. One of the things we did see with our data um, is you know, good instruction, good learning is having students work together, work in groups. Uh, we want to encourage that. And so a lot of times in our elementary classrooms, you might see four students who are together kind of facing each other. Um, when we noticed that we started to get an increased number of students who were testing positive um, for COVID, um, what we did was have those students separate back out of those pods. Um, and so that would be another type of response we would have in a situation uh, where we see an increased number in the classroom. We're, we're hopeful that students are still starting and they're in those collaborative groups and so on, and that's just how we can respond in those situations to slow that down um, so we can get back to normal as quickly as possible um, in those situations. Testing, um, test to stay is placed on hold right now. Test to stay was used when we were doing quarantining of students. So if we had students who were in close proximity to a positive, um, they could opt to test to stay, uh, which means that they would test a certain number of uh, times during um, uh, that period of time. And if their test kept coming back negative, they could stay in school during that time. Um, and so um, without us doing the contact tracing, um, we're not going to be doing the, the test to stay um, at this point in time. Uh, if we start to see a heavy increase in numbers, that could be something we come back to and we would uh, make sure that we inform both the board and the community of that. At-home kits, we received a lot of at-home kits uh, in the district uh, that were sent to us from numerous different sources. I know we have at least 9,000. I think we might be over 10,000. Um, kits will be pushed out with a higher percentage of kits going to the schools that were doing considerable test to, t to stay procedures last year. So even when test to stay was available, a lot of our schools or the families in the schools uh, weren't choosing to do test to stay. Um, so we'll be sending those kits to the locations um, where people were choosing test to stay. Um, all schools will receive some kits. So if, if parents do not have access to kits and they want a kit, um, some schools will have, um, all schools should have some. I don't know how long that availability will stay in place. 
Um, the at-home test kits cannot be done in school. Um, we're not allowed to do that. Last year, we had tests to stay in school, but that's only done. So tests um, cannot be done in school since the district does not have that um, CLIA um, license, uh, and th that stands for Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, um, and that's, uh, once again, just it's a regulating um, if you're um, testing human specimens, and uh, obviously we do not have that license. Masks are encouraged. Um, uh, we're hoping we don't uh, get in a situation where masks are required. Um, uh, there's, we don't know what the future holds, um, and we're hoping we're not in that situation, um, but we, we could find ourselves in that situation. Um, hopefully not. Um, we are still going to be encouraging hand washing, respiratory etiquette. Um, we're still making sure that our ventilation systems are uh, running at the best capacity that they can. Um, and we're still, you might have recently seen that we're still promoting uh, vaccinations as well. Um, and so we continue um, to encourage um, things for all students um, to be safe. Um, we are required to protect students um, who are at a higher risk uh, due to medical situations. Instruction uh, during isolation, once again, you see isolation, not quarantine. Um, because that's where our focus is at. Our focus is on the students who are displaying the symptoms who are, or who have tested positive. Uh, students in isolation will receive remote learning based on individual needs while greatly influenced by the courses each student is enrolled in and by what is planned in each class at the time of the absence. This is very similar to last year. It looked different at each level depending on what those students' needs are. Um, might be dependent on if they... Um, uh, have English as a second language, or if they have an IEP. Um, there's all different factors that play into it, how long they're out, um, and what kind of supports we would have in place. Um, early childhood through first grade will, um, at the minimum, have choice boards. Second through 12th grade all have access to a great tool um, that we can identify all the things that are kind of being done in class uh, content-wise as well as any kind of homework or assignments to work on, um, especially, I, I think, important for our, our middle school and high school students. Um, and there might be some individualized types of supports for our students, as I said, um, with IEPs, including our students at the STEPS program. Um, I'm sure we'll find different ways of how we're going to meet the needs of the students um, who are out during isolation. Um, our main goal here is to have as many students in school as much as possible. Um, that is one of the, the big reasons that we're really focusing on um, the students who are positive and not the contact tracing part, which was also exhausting a lot of our um, resources um, at the same time. And so, um, that's where our focus is, and that's why we're referring that to infection control versus contact tracing. So with that, I would be, uh, I'll be glad to do my best at trying to answer uh, any questions uh, that you might have uh, related to this. Ms. Stemming. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Macarius, and just excited that uh, we're able to be in the situation that we are. Thank you to all the staff that have tried to ensure that uh, our students continue to be as safe as possible, and I uh, have no questions. Mr. Krubus. Can you uh, expand a little bit uh, more about ventilation briefly? What has been done? what we plan to do uh, going forward. Excellent. Dr. Talley. I'm gonna turn that over to Dr. Talley <laughs> on that one. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine because I, I have some very specific information to share and I, I think it's, so uh, actually a couple of years ago, we uh, put together a video and in it we talked about the work we've been doing with ventilation to improve it in the district. One, we, the type of filters, we use what are called MERV, 13 filters. They are the top of the line filters that we can use. 
Um, and so um, that's what we put into place. Additionally, um, the amount of proper ventilation code requires 15 cubic feet per minute per occupant during occupied times. We currently are doing beyond that. Um, our HVAC equipment is able to, um, it, we increase our minimum fresh air intake to 25 to 30%. When in temperatures and humidity allows, we can get up to 100% fresh air was brought in. So this has been an increase for our ventilation in our schools. <coughs> Um, we will uh, go in and look, once we have students in place, we can also look at what is our CO2 levels in our schools um, and uh, to determine if we're providing enough oxygen in our buildings. So um, we've done quite a bit over the last couple of years to increase and improve our ventilation in our schools. Thank you. Um, I think that's an important aspect, the ventilation was mentioned but it's not its own slide and there was prior work done that's just not a part of this presentation but that is one of the mitigations that is part of our protocol and I would appreciate administration following through with the the testing I'm reporting back to the board um, on on how it's going um, I know we have different loads in different areas and you know if you have uh, uh, choral concert or you know one person at a gym it's obviously a lot different so uh, the second point I want to ask about is our uh, district handbook. It still has some information in there about um, some of the COVID protocols, uh, which included masking. Um, we've made some changes to our plan this year from prior years, but we've retained the COVID protocols which include masking requirements if used in, in the district parent handbook. Um, can you comment on that, please? Dr. Talley. As uh, Mr. Carey has mentioned, our goal is to be in session and to try to be as pre-COVID as possible. Um, however, COVID is still with us. Um, we have to be very mindful of that. We are trying to protect children and staff. And I, I, want to, I want to underline the staff piece, because if we don't have enough staff in our building, we can't run schools. And I remember last year, we were some, some situations where we were pulling people from central office to go into schools to ensure that uh, we could run the schools, because the whole administrative staff, um, they were out of the buildings. So because of that, there may be an occasion where we might have to re-implement uh, some of the strategies that are mentioned in the handbook. We hope, we are praying we will not have to, but there is always the possibility that that could go into effect, including mass required. With that said, again, I want to re reiterate, we hope, we are planning that we don't have to do that, but it is possible. Thank you. And drilling down further on that point, page three, yeah. Um, talks about masks are encouraged at the end of the second big bullet point but higher up it talks about students returning to campus on day six wearing a mask through day seven clarify for me whether the wearing of the mask during day six to day seven is mandatory currently um, if someone tests positive when they return on day six through ten they are required to wear a mask and so in if unable to do so, um, then they would be out for 10 days. It's not just unable to, it's unable to and if they would be unwilling to mask. That if they're not wearing a mask on six through 10 after being positive, um, they would be out for 10 days. I have no, nothing further. Thank you. Ms. Grover. Um, I just want to clarify a few things, Doug. So if a person tests positive or if a person has symptoms, they are to isolate for five days and then they can come back if they're masked from six to ten.
That is, if there's, are you, if they're probable positive, which means they have symptoms and they were within proximity of someone maybe in their household who had tested positive, um, that's what it would look like. If they're symptomatic and without testing or refusing testing, it would be the same thing. However, if they then go and get tested and, um, or they uh, come with a note from their doctor that says, no, they're suffering from this, then it's gonna be whenever those symptoms are clear, um, if it's not um, connected to COVID. So if you are probable positive, that could be the same thing as symptomatic in the sense that if you're probable positive, you can take the test and be negative and come. Or do you still have to isolate for zero days? Like if I, if I say a family member has it, so I've probably been around them for two days, but then I test myself and I am negative, can I come to school or do I need to isolate? Um, I would have to respond back to you with clarification from okay. um, our nursing department on that. Okay. Um, typically, th the challenge there is, um, I would say most likely not. If you're pro if it's in your household and they were positive and you're already experiencing those symptoms, um, is that okay. what you're saying? I'm or not no? experiencing symptoms and I test negative. I, 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 here's what I would recommend we do. Yeah. These are ifs that yeah. are very difficult that we really shouldn't answer on the fly. Okay. So I would recommend that uh, when the situation comes, we have a conversation with our chief nurse, and then that way we can make sure we are giving the right answer. Correct. And and that's that's one. Sometimes yes. with a big family, sometimes it'll happen. That one of the kids is, and one of the kids isn't, and so that's where I was going with this. Um, and uh, this is school is starting and I don't know I didn't ask this in advance but I know one of the things is lockers for especially middle school do we have do we know what we're doing or am I just I don't know what we're okay. doing this the time. school principals will inform the families about what's happening with lockers um, I, it'll be very similar to last year if I'm not mistaken with regards to the use of but principals will provide that information to their families great and that's it thank you right. sorry about that Ms. Jane. Um, thank you, Mr. Carius, for today's presentation. Um, I think I have uh, some questions along the same lines as Board Member Grover. So uh, it's more of a clarification between what you're defining as a probable case, which is symptoms plus close contact of a positive person, and then also uh, for me, differentiating between that and then someone who's symptomatic but is not uh, does not have contact with someone who's positive. So, as a parent, um, just understanding how to navigate that. Um, should we expect our child to be returned home and then you know promptly picked up and then go through testing in order for the child to go, to go back if if they're negative? That, that so, if for instance, a child um, comes to school and they're showing a temperature of 101. Um, they shouldn't be at school with a temperature of 101 in the first place. So they'll call the parent um, to come and pick them up or um, what that procedure looks like or, or um, their guardian, whoever that might be listed uh, to pick them up. Um, typically, if they're seeing symptoms that are similar to COVID and there's not a different explanation for that, they would at that time, the nurse would probably say, we um, recommend that they go to um, get a COVID test and let us know, you know what that is. If they refuse to get a COVID test or go to the doctor, it would go into treating it as if it were COVID and it would be the five days of isolation um, followed by the five days of mask wearing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, that's, okay. that's helpful. Thank you for If they back. leave though, because they're sick, they go to their doctor, the doctor diagnoses them with strep, puts them on an antibiotic, um, and says that they would, they're fine in 24 hours and their symptoms are um, gone by that time, no more fever at that time, then they would be able to come to school at that time. Yeah, and if, if the student goes home, um, takes a home test, it's negative, and then is no longer symptomatic the next day, they could come home? Or go to school? 
So that's the, uh, another probably, scenario. Probably a little bit. However, however, interesting here, here's what I will say. <laughs> Today I met all of our nurses. Uh, it was their first day back. They're a wonderful group of people. And so that's why having the relationship with your school nurse would be the person who right. can therefore walk you through the um, uh, flow chart. Yeah. I, I don't um, want this to um, be perceived as um, um, more difficult than it was. This is almost identical to last year, except we're not doing the contact tracing. <laughs> Um, and uh, doing that whole quarantining process. So it's, we're focused on if someone's positive or symptoms, um, we wanna try to um, minimize that spread as quickly as possible and for those students to not be in schools, they shouldn't be if they're sick, so. Great, thanks, that's, that's a great way of putting that. Um, the other thing I wanted to just ask was, you had mentioned that we anticipate some changes from the CDC uh, in preparing our protocols, what organizations or who did we consult uh, to come up with our plan? Well, most recently ISBE came out with um, their guidance and some requirements and IDPH was along with that on um, their um, guidelines at that, that time. We also consult with our nurses who stay in close contact with the um, health department. Um, I, don't, I know that th uh, we also, um, at times, Dr. Talley um, is usually pretty good at getting a response from the DuPage County Health Department. <coughs> on, um, we've heard about some districts doing some different things. Um, uh, and whether that would be supported by the health department um, or not. And so just um, with our local health department, I would say uh, we, we do try to get information from other school districts near us to see how they're handling situations at the same time um, because I, I do think that helps to make things a little bit less confusing uh, in the community. Thank you so much. I have no other questions. Mr. Rising. Um, yeah, I would be interested to see that clarification too, especially the question Ms. Grover asked, um, and just making sure that we're making that known and there's consistency across the district, because I know a lot of times, and, and maybe we have another Q&A, like if this scenario happens, you know, like we used to have on the, the COVID dashboard thing. Um, regarding <coughs> remote learning, for students that are in isolation because they were COVID positive, we have to provide that, correct? We have to provide uh, remote learning, yes. That you went over. Um, as far as other illnesses though, I mean, those students are getting similar materials, aren't they? Or yeah, is they're it, gonna is get the same thing. They, all, they still have access to Google Class. That's the, the great thing about Google Classroom and that we have that ability. Um, any student registered for that class can go in there and see, you know, what either the assignments were are or what the homework is or those things. It's a great communication. So we're not punishing students or f playing favoritism regardless if they have COVID or not or if they're home for the flu or something else. They're getting the same resources, all of those students. They have access to the same resources. Okay. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm extremely happy with where we're at. Um, you know, uh, no contact tracing, which is, I think, a step forward, no quarantining, no students in close proximity that'll be quarantined, no test to stay, masks are recommended or optional, depending on what you wanna say, what your preference is. Um, you know, this board has really said from the beginning that we aren't medical doctors, um, and we were gonna follow the guidance by IDPH and DuPage County Health Department um, I think our board has been extremely consistent and we've stayed true to the metrics we said we were gonna always follow. Um, even in the spring when we announced we were gonna go mask recommended, um, that was because of the metrics that we set as a district that we moved to that, that moderate rate, I believe, because um, I think at that point they were calling it substantial, moderate, and minimal. Um, but, you know, I, I'm glad that we are focusing 
on the students that are COVID positive and, and making sure that, um, listen, all of us as board members and the whole community, we all have differing views on this, but overall, all of us want to keep students safe. And, um, you know, I learned early on that you're not always going to make 100% of the people happy, but I think this is a great point forward, and I think um, this is a wonderful compromise. Um, you know, we all want kids in school as much as possible, and uh, now we're coming down to parent responsibility. Parents need to keep their kids home if they're sick, bottom line. So thanks for all your work on this. Um, and just for clarification, the five days are not five school days. Um, remember, that's days of the week, so, yeah. you know, it might be three days that they're missing school for, just for clarification. No, thanks. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Ms. Fazdick. Thank you, Zach, for the information. I really just have one question that um, I think some community members might be wondering, which is if you have a COVID-positive student coming back wearing a mask from days 6 through 10, how will lunch be handled? Do we know that? Or will that be an individual classroom decision or principal building level decision? So obviously a child has to take off a mask to eat. Right. And if we're asking them to come back masked, how will that be handled? Some of the biggest things that we found is not having students directly across from each other when they're in that situation. Um, we, there have definitely been some advantages to having students with a little bit more room in the lunchrooms. We don't have the greatest space to spread um, students out. And we're not saying that we're just gonna send them somewhere else, but we'll do our best to give them a little bit more space. Um, um, we've, just as a side, I mean, we've seen that that's been a good thing for some behaviors in the lunchroom as well <laughs> at the same time, uh, having a little bit of space. So some schools are gonna continue to tr just to try to give more space, because you probably remember, you're usually sitting on top of each other um, at those lunch tables in there. And so, um, but there's not gonna be, um, we're not in a situation where we're going to say anybody who has COVID has to sit over here at this table. Okay. Thank you. So I think everybody asked the questions that I had on my list, um, but I do want to emphasize some of the points people have brought up that um, I think it is uh, a good evolution of the current situation that we are focused on positive students or highly probable students instead of a broader um, action across the district. And um, I guess I wanna repeat that we're um, continue to be consistent with health department guidance, which has been kind of our mantra for the last couple of years and that we are continuing to say that with our actions and plan. And um, I'll repeat what um, Mr. Rising said, that it really is important for us uh, to keep our students and our staff safe, and we want everyone to be in school. So our plan was put in place to make sure that we are executing on that um, priority for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our last item is legislative advocacy and the Board of Education update. And I believe Ms. Grover and Mr. Rising have an update from IASB. So um, Mr. Rising and myself went on Friday um, to discuss our resolutions in front of the IASB panel. Um, so we presented the two resolutions. So this year they changed the way they did things, they would not tell us whether they are adopting the resolution or not the same day. So uh, Mr. Rising and myself presented the two resolutions. Resolution 11 and 12 were both amendments. 11 was the nonpartisan resolution and we were going to add language that said um, that ISB should um, strongly support school board candidates that should not solicit, accept, or receive either donation or financial contribution from special interest groups, political action committees, or political parties. That was resolution 11. 
Um, so today at five o'clock, Mr. Rising and myself received an email telling us what they thought about our resolutions and that one they actually adopted. So that one passed. Their, recommend their, recommendation. their recommendation is do adopt. To, to, yes. to do adopt, correct. Um, resolution 12, which was amending um, a resolution from the language of candidate support to legislation position support. So the initial resolution was saying that IESB would encourage and assist school board members to effectively evaluate positions of legislative candidates and they would support those candidates. So we were saying to amend the language to say legislative positions. Um, interestingly, when Mr. Rising and I presented this resolution, there were no questions, no questions on the floor. So Mr. Rising and myself thought that, oh, this one is the easy one. We actually did 12 first. We, they, we asked to do 12 before 11. Right. We thought 11 would have more conversation. More conversation. This one had no questions. And uh, when we got the email today, well, we were shocked because um, this one they recommended do not adopt. Um, so as a board. But they put a caveat saying they were happy with the language as it read, you know, but we could appeal. Yeah. Yes, we could appeal. There's a procedure to appeal if we want to appeal it. Um, so, I mean, since we just got this email, we haven't had time to kind of process everything, but that's where we are. Um, Mr. Rising, you want to add anything? No. Natasha did awesome. Oh, thanks. We, did a, we were a good team. <laughs> Any idea what do they indicate why they're doing a different process? Was it length of time? Length of time. Different? So okay. it was really interesting because we had two resolutions and they gave us 15 minutes. They gave everybody 15 minutes. There was a school district that had three resolutions. You got 15 minutes. Um, I think because last year when we went, Miss Jane and I went, we were, we were lucky because we were the second party. So we were done at like 6.15, but they went on to midnight. So this time, Mr. Rising and myself, we were number 11 and 12, and there was only two resolutions after us. So they ended with um, 16. That's right. They, they only had 16 resolutions this time. Oh, so total. I think total. So I think they reduced the number of resolutions as well, and length of time was 15 minutes each, and that's it. And, and I think my assumption um, is that they wanted to knock the questions out to the submitting district and then have discussions between all the delegate representatives and um, you know because even on number 11 we said listen you know if you want to recommend changes to the language you're more than happy to do so right um, but they came back and said do adopt so um, you know but they yeah they probably met for a few hours after we were done and we were done at I think we walked out of there 8 30. yeah you did that helps because I know the one year I did, they were making, but there was a suggestion, you're almost crafting it then in order that yes. the resolution is read the way that it's going to be read to vote and right. months later. So makes sense. Nice work, yeah. guys. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, thank you for spending your Friday night going to that. I mean, 8 o'clock on a Friday night is kind of a strange time to have a, a meeting, so I really appreciate that. And I'm actually very surprised by the outcome because I thought the one that they didn't approve was the less controversial by far than the other one. Um, so, Quick question. Do you plan on appealing number 12? So that was the question. So we just oh, got you this. just got that. We and really got it. We're yeah, going to send, you mentioned like, that. Um, talk to the, you know, just figure out where we are um, and figure that out. Um, the intent is there, which is, you know, it's more, resolution was more um, the one we wanted to pass anyway. So Ooh. we'll figure it out. Again. Yeah, Natasha's our delegate representative, but I'm sure her and I will have a discussion and she will probably email all of us and ask for individual feedback directly to her and and see what your thoughts are after we can dissect a little bit about what they say yeah so to be clear to the process is IASB uh, receives all these resolutions and then you present to a committee and the committee decides which resolutions they will recommend or not recommend and the ones they recommend they will bring into the state conference where each school board has a delegate and can vote on the resolution. Yes. Yes. And, and it even gets deeper than that if you really want to go because 
if districts don't like certain resolutions, they can appeal at the delegate assembly at the state conference, or they can approve a bunch of them via consent agenda. Um, so this process is, is far from over, you know, because people might even, even though the, the, the counties or the, the divisions of IASB and their representatives, even though for number 11 they recommended do adopt, um, you know, people could have an issue with that and raise those questions and then there's still the vote, so. And those, those resolutions though that they recommend do not adopt, those still go on the? Those usually stay as do not adopt unless the submitting district makes an appeal and the delegate assembly committee changes their mind. Um, usually it just kind of falls to the wayside. But they're still there for people to vote is what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, the, the, the delegate representatives could totally flip it, right? And say, sure. no, wait, we like that, we disagree with, you know. But that, that hasn't happened too many times. And you have no idea what IESB is going to put on their consent agenda item. Um, last year, they had put a resolution on the consent agenda item, and there were other resolutions, but anybody can pull those from mm -hmm. the consent agenda item. So if there's a, a vote to pull, do you want to pull this one? Do you want to pull this one? So they did not pull ours. So, you know, if they do pull one, then you're there defending your resolution. So Natasha may yeah. have to make comments defending. Yeah, this one again. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and as a board, we get both the adopt and do not adopt list, and we discuss it as a board. And we have at times disagreed with the recommendation from IASB on certain resolutions where they might have said adopt, and we said no, we don't agree with that. So um, it can change pretty significantly after. Um, but also, when a resolution is finally accepted, at, at the school, uh, across all the school boards. It doesn't mean that suddenly some kind of law or something in the state, it means that IASB will take that position when working with the legislative bodies to um, look for opportunities to position things that the, are important to IASB. So that so. was actually raised about mm -hmm. number 11 mm -hmm. by some of the division representatives um, asking about number 11 and what punishment there would be, you know, but we also responded that it would still need to go to legislation and, you know, and then they asked if that's something we would want codified by legislation and Natasha's like, yes, we want to codify it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, but I think the way we positioned it was we believe it's important that school board races stay nonpartisan, um, and that that the, our language, additional language, further sets a precedent of how strongly IASB believes that school board elections should remain, you know, nonpartisan. So, um, and, and you know, we could see nodding across the room. So. Um, the other um, change that IASB made this year was, and maybe this is the reason for only having 16 submitted versus the large volume we've seen in the past, is that they uh, encouraged the school districts to focus on only the areas that were important to IASB. So they had several key areas that w were shared, and then districts were encouraged to only submit um, resolutions that supported those positions in some way so yeah so thank you and uh i guess we'll have further discussion in the future but thank you for your work and effort and supporting that and um our board has a history of getting uh resolutions or amendments passed every year and so it looks like hopefully we're on the same path again to continue that record so but does anyone have any other items Okay, with that, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>